Okay. So if um, I know that sometimes things like the research design, the assumptions, um, some of the aspects of the CQA are hard to find. And some of you might be struggling a little bit with that. And that's what this video is about, is to help you find these things. And I'm using two articles that we've already read in class, plus I might get to an article of mine to show you, sometimes it's buried, sometimes it's more clear, just kind of where do you find these things? How do you bring them out, all right? So the first article I'm gonna talk about is the Bruns article that we read earlier in class about early childhood practitioners' beliefs about inclusion. If you remember this, this is a fairly short article. I'm gonna scroll through the introduction because unlike a lot of articles, they don't actually get to their research design until the end of what is essentially the lit review. All right, so here is a little bit about the research design. It says, this article provides the results of a needs assessment. Um, I'm gonna actually here point to where I am. Um, of beliefs, skills, and training needs of pre-K and Head Start teachers that include young children with disabilities in the ECE setting. So by reading the rest of the article, you'll be able to unpack this and actually write it up. Like, I don't want you to just quote this. I want you to read the rest of the article and be like, well, what exactly did they do? This gives me a clue, but it's, you know, unpacked in the rest of the article. Now, as we move down, there's this word instrumentation. So that's a really good clue that they're going to describe the instrument, and that's where we're going to look for the validity of the instrument. All right. Now, in this case, they don't use any good words like validity as clues, right? They just talk about how it was developed, but that is part of content validity. The STARS needs assessment was developed from existing literature about effective practices with young children. So they're saying that's part of content validity as they developed it from existing literature. Another part of content validity is that a preliminary draft was shared with the coordinator, right? And that these folks gave feedback. So that's another way they established content validity. Now they could have done a lot more. I would certainly critique a lot about this measure, but that's where you get their start. That's what they're talking about in terms of content validity. In terms of consequential and epistemic validity, that is all you. Like you have to look at this instrument, you have to think about it. Maybe there's some items further down in the article or in the appendix and think about what is the consequential validity of this instrument for teachers? What is the epistemic validity in terms of what it assumes about teachers and students? And in this case, the epistemic validity is probably okay because it has to do with, you know, really supporting students in inclusive practices, all right? So now we've got a sampling procedure, okay? Now it doesn't use the word sampling. So once again, it's kind of buried, right? Like it's disguised, but, and they talk about an online search identifying 14 Head Start um, programs and 29 pre-K programs, and that it's in this area of Illinois, right? So you know, they have this area of Illinois and then they identified these programs. And then they talk about how they got the survey out there, okay? So here's where you can write up how did they do their sampling and then you can critique it. Do you think they did a good job? Do you think the way that they did it was appropriate in terms of getting a good sample of Head Start and pre-K teachers in this area? I mean, obviously they can't do it across the whole country and that's okay, but like, you know, at least for this area, did they do something that really ensured that they have an understanding of pre-K and Head Start teachers in this area? Now, data analysis, this is a really good clue. When it says data analysis, that is a very good clue that it's going to be um, your uh, statistical analysis. And they do talk about that. They say, um, aggregate as well as Head Start and pre-K only frequencies were compiled for the items in part one, two, and three. Frequencies were also completed for the demographic items. So that's one piece of their analysis. Now, they also buried some analysis later on. Now, here we go. So this is funny, they split the sampling. They split how they got the sample and what the sample actually was. <laughs> and so here we see what the sample actually was. And again, you can give your analysis of, well, is this an adequate sample? Okay, um, 
So then they get into the results. So the results that's you uh, is not as important in CQA one and two, but it will be in CQA three. All right. Um, now let me get into assumptions here for a second, because assumptions you have to really read the whole article and think about what their assumptions are. It's usually not written up in a very clear way. So Bronze and McGrabin are looking at um, the inclusive beliefs of teachers, right? And the way they talk about it in the very beginning seems like they have an asset-based model of teachers. But they also have um, a, an assumption that inclusion of students with disabilities is important, right? So that's so assumption number one, is that inclusion with, of students with disabilities is really important. Um, and then the assumption number two is probably that teachers have the capability of having these positive beliefs. Now, for a different story, we have um, the article about morality that we read during that same time period, right? So this is Judy and Nelson, relationship between parents, peers, morality, and theft, etc. Okay, so now let's look at an, an assumption is in the very beginning of this article. It says, in recent years, the behavior of adolescents has become increasingly problematic and threatening to the well-being of our nation. Woo! I mean, there are some massive assumptions here in terms of like what's going on for adolescents, why, right? There's no, there's no identification of the system within which behaviors are created, right? Systems of oppression. There's a deficit model going on here. I mean, there's all kinds of assumptions here that I know that you all could, would do a very good job of unpacking. Um, so those are some assumptions we, and there's many more in this article. Let's look down now at where the research design is. So often they have some stuff about the research design at the end of the introduction or the end of the lit review. And looking here, you can see the same thing. It says the purpose of the study was to examine the relationships between the delinquent behavior of theft and each of the following variables, moral level, peer involvement, et cetera. So this word right here, relationships, is very important to the research design. That means if it's quantitative, they're going to be doing um, some kind of quantitative analysis like a regression that is going to determine the relationships between two different variables, right? And then they even say the predicted relationships are as follows, and then they give four hypotheses, right? These are very important to the research design. Um, they say, for example, um, in number two, that peer theft scores will show a stronger correlation with self-reported theft scores um, than will measures of morality. Okay, so that's one of their hypotheses that they're testing. Now, in, under method, they have this word participants. That's a very good clue. It's gonna talk about sampling. And they say 83 male and 91 female students from this middle class of Southeastern Virginia High School participated. And then it talks a little bit about who they are. So um, I said they don't really talk about why they selected this school. And that's something that you would maybe critique in your discussion of the sampling. Now, under materials, this is the same thing sort of as instruments, right? They talk about the instrument. Now, um, this is where you can talk about validity of the instrument. And they do actually mention um, some aspects of validity. They talk about um, a factor analysis, which is part of validity, developing validity. Um, they talk about reliability. Um, and then they talk about a different study assessing the validity, right? So they really write up the validity and reliability of this measure in depth here. Um, now, you don't need to go, of course, to the other study, but I would say that, generally speaking, they do a pretty good job of telling us that the, the, the um, test has content validity. Now, your question is, does it have consequential and epistemic validity? And I definitely think some of these, uh, maybe not the parental bonding instrument, but some of these, like the theft inventory, may have some real issues with epistemic validity. Um, so then there's a little bit about the statistical analysis here. The statistical analysis in this article is quite varied. So they talk about obtaining these scores, 
Um, and then somewhere in here, actually it's in the results, they talk about their actual um, statistical analysis. Um, and the, they talk about in the first, testing the first hypothesis, um, a general linear model, which is a regression, was created at alpha level 0 0.05. That's P is less than 0 0.05. So they are disguising their language up and down, but essentially, um, if you look for the word model, if you look for the word alpha, if you look for the you know P value, those kinds of words, you can even do a search, you might be able to find um, the statistical analysis. Like what did they do in order to get the results? So when I ask for statistical analysis, I'm not asking for the results. I'm asking for how did they manipulate the data? What did they do to the data to get particular results? All right. Now, one final article I'm going to look at. This is an article of mine. Um, and um, this is one where it's maybe a little bit more clearly laid out. All right. Um, so looking through the introduction. Um, there's various, you know, discussion of variables. I'm not going to talk about the assumptions on this one. Um, and then here you see this is the research design, right? That there's going to be a test of these various hypotheses, hypotheses, right? Then very clearly it says sampling procedure. And so you can see the write up of the sampling procedure right here. Now, for those of you who um, were interested in how do we understand what is the appropriate sample size, a power analysis, that is written up right there. Um, then again, you see this word instrumentation. So now here we're talking about the actual instrument, the survey, and how valid it is. And there's an actually a section that says validation. So then you would get your information there from the validation. And then finally, scrolling down, you can see a section that says analysis. Scrolling down a long ways, or it says model rather. Model is another word for statistical analysis. So that's another word you can look for. Um, people say we use a particular kind of model, right? So in this case, it was a multi-level model and it was examining certain things in relationship, okay? So hopefully this elucidation of where to find things and how you have to kind of sometimes unpack the article a little bit to get at particularly the validity of the instrument and the statistical design. Those things can be a little bit buried. Um, and assumptions, of course, are really all you. Like you have to really think about what assumptions they're making. So hopefully that will help you in writing the critical quantitative analysis.